about to go live now, which is really nice. So everyone needs to be very respectful now. I should just add, Miss Trafford, before we start, we will share this link um, so all members of the school community can see it as we do every week with these lecture series. So if for some reason you feel really uncomfortable with being on camera, please switch it off. But most of you will be totally fine. So please let us see your amazing faces. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's nice for me as a speaker to see your faces. So a great big warm Cambridge Homeschool welcome to you. Thank you so much. I know you've had a busy day learning at school and that we are now about to um, embark on thinking about how we can make ourselves even smarter than we already are. And I wanted to start off by saying um, that I'm going to use lots of questions in this talk. So I've put the chat bar up for me. I'm going to keep you on your toes and uh, I will be asking you various questions throughout the talk. And at the end of the talk, there'll be a chance for you to come off your mic and talk to me um, and you will be recorded. But at the moment during the talk, we're going to do kind of silent chit chat which is using that chat bar so um there's no um accident there either because one of the best ways to learn is to ask questions so that's why i'm going to ask questions of you so i wanted to start off by saying that um i've put a statement um as my title and the statement is how to be smart and i don't mean dress smart I mean, be smart, intelligent. And it's rather a funny statement. Does it mean then, if we think about that statement, that being smart isn't just about being born smart? OK, so we call that an, an innate ability, something that you're born with. Does it mean, and this is where you, you should get excited, that you can actually become more smart than you already are now? No matter who you are or where you are, when you came leaping into the world, you can become more smart. So that's quite an exciting idea. So I'm going to show you now uh, a very, very uh, common idea that I think you might have seen before uh, by a very famous researcher called Carol Dweck, Carol Dweck. And he writes about what we call uh, a growth mindset, a growth mindset. And what Carol Dweck says here is that the hand you're dealt is just a starting point for development. And then we've got a little pack of cards there. And the implication is that you're either born lucky, you're either born with a really good hand of cards, you know, kings, aces, I don't know, I don't play cards, whatever. Or you're born unlucky and therefore you're not going to win at life. And I think what Carl Dweck is saying here is we need to really challenge that. Your, your smartness is not set at birth. And it's um, everything to do with not just your, your brain, but your attitude to life and your mindset. So, and um, the reason I'm saying that is because I've been I've been teaching a long, long time, maybe uh, since a date that you won't remember, since about 1989, I started going into schools when I was teacher training a long time ago. And since then, I have heard lots and lots of students say to me, well, I used to be smart, but I'm not smart anymore which is a really interesting thing, isn't it? That's quite an odd thing to say. And I've also heard lots of students say to me, I never used to be smart, but I am now. So that suggests that even from 
anecdotes. So that's little stories that people tell you that smartness isn't a set trait characteristic that you could maybe lose it a bit. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to go that way. Or you can become more smart. So I know you're probably not prepared for this because I'm an English teacher, but uh, what we're going to do is actually go into the world of science to begin our, our thinking about what that means. And it's really important. Yeah, it's really important we think about the science of this. Um, so I've got uh, some science to back up what uh, that statement said, that you're not just born with set smartness, that your brain can change. So this science is from a scientist called Mercado, which is interesting, Dr. Supermarket. And he did all his research in a very famous university in America in the town of Buffalo. I've funnily enough been to Buffalo. And um, what he did was he looked at our brains, this great big physical lump that's up here. And I've got a nice picture of a fancy brain there with little lit up points on it. Your brain's a kind of grey colour. That's a good thing, by the way, that it's grey. And um, what he uh, suggests is that it's really important to understand what's going on in your brain because there's a real physical element as to how clever we can be and perhaps even how clever we can become, which are two different things. Yeah. So what he discovered, and again, research has moved on because a long, long time ago, even before I was a teacher, I did my psychology degree and we looked at brains and we had a theory about how we learn. And that was 35 years ago now. And way back then, they had this theory that your brain worked a bit like how computer processors work now. And that's why computers are the way they are. Uh, we we modelled it on the way the human brain worked. And they thought that um, if we had an idea, it set off some little lights going off in different bits of the brain. And we got these kind of associations so that our brains were like, sorry if I'm losing anyone, I'm trying to make it really so simple. Mr Boylan will get this. He's going to get cross at me now. That our brain is a bit like a, a network of tube lines or railway lines, all crisscrossing. And the more we do stuff, the more connections that we form. And that's what people thought. Now, there's been very recent signs that believes that actually there are now these vertical columns in our brains called cortical modules. Don't worry about the name, but these vertical columns. And um, in our brains, in my brain, the size of the column and the amount of the columns is different from the size of the columns in, say, my daughter's brain or my friend's brain or your brain. So does this mean then that my intelligence is completely fixed because of the size of my vertical columns and the number of them? Well, what he discovered was that there are certain aspects of your brain structure that determine how easily you learn new things. OK, certain aspects. So, so presumably the bigger the columns, the more columns, it will be easier for you to remember stuff. But also our learning, what we learn and, and what we do as a human contributes to the differences in our intelligence. So what you do and what you learn about can change your intelligence. Now, the key words here, and uh, these aren't difficult words, is plasticity. Now, that comes from the word plastic, yeah? So it's kind of how flexible our brains are and how connected they are, you know? How well connected the ideas are in our brain. And it's a, a really important concept to grasp because 
it's it would be wrong of me to say to you that the bigger the brain, the more intelligent you are, even though we know that that's what it's like with animals. Yeah, tiny brain, not so clever. But that's not quite the whole story. For example, it's not quite the biggest footballer on the pitch who's the best player. Yeah, we all know that little players can be Maradona brilliant. So it's much more about how your brain performs, not just about how big it is. Yeah, and that's the good news. So your experience is as important as your genetics. So I suppose what we might be thinking about now is how can I improve my experiences to make myself a little bit clever? Well, let me just move this up a bit. I'm not very clever. At, see, I'm not very clever at working an Apple Mac. Here we go. So the good news is that it, it feels like Dweck's assumption that we can become more clever is, is actually true. There's a scientific basis for it. Yeah. So every time you learn something, your brain develops a bit more. And that's why we have some people more intelligent than others. And as these networks of neurons, that's brain cells, develop over time, they become more and more varied and increase. And they lead to a lot more what we call cognitive plasticity. And I suppose I say that in another way, that just means you become a much more flexible person, much more able to make leaps and connections between I ideas. So um, whatever it is that you want to become better at, you can become better at it. So this is where I'm going to pause for a second. And if you can access the chat bar, I would love you to put in the chat bar what you would like to become better at. Is there something you would like to become better at or know more about? And you can just fill up the chat bar with a few of your little ideas. OK, so as you're doing that. There's a but and there's always a but with these things, yeah? So what you're looking at on the screen there is a lovely, beautiful, special magnification of a neuron. And a neuron is a brain cell and leaping out from the brain cell are, are what we call dendrites and they carry information. And in order for that to happen, there is a little electrical current going off. And in the little electrical current in your brain are chemicals. And these chemicals really affect your emotions. Yeah. So it's it's not just our brain that is calling all the shots. We actually have these emotions that come from, I suppose, our reaction to our environment. So we've got the rest of our body feeding our brain all the time information and that can cause our neurons to let off some sort of chemical reactions that can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming for us. So some of you might know what those chemicals are. I imagine some of you older students will. You will know about things like serotonin and adrenaline and they can make us feel various things. And I've, I've said in the box there that sometimes your body can actually be stopping you from becoming smart or it could help you to get smarter. So um, I'm going to give you another little bit of science here. We call our brain the central nervous system. Now you've all seen Inside Out 
And if you haven't watched Inside Out, I would really recommend it, highly recommend it, because you get the sense of the brain being a control centre, yeah? The control centre for your body. Some of you are nodding and smiling. And your, your brain is full of lots of information, your memories, your visual perception, your ability to speak, feel pain, all sorts of stuff. Harrison, stick it in the chat. Stick it in the chat and we'll look at it later. Uh, and, Ms. Stafford, I'm sorry, yeah. I really don't mean to interrupt, but it seems for a lot of students the chat function isn't available, myself included. Ah, thank you, Aditya. Thank you. I am so sorry about that. In that case, when I said, please write down what you want to be best at, please write it down on a bit of paper because this is going to be a little process, yeah? And anything that you want to talk about or ask me, tell me at the end and we'll go through it, yeah? It's been, it's a bit sciencey at the moment, but it's so important to understand the science because then that will inspire you and motivate you to, to do some of the techniques. So um, our, our brain is there, it's making all sorts of decisions for us, uh, some of which we know and some of them we don't know about at all. Like for example, uh, here at the very back of your brain is a big bit called the medulla and that's making all sorts of decisions about breathing. You haven't thought about breathing, have you? Not even since before you were born. And that's because the brain automatically gets on with it. So our brain doesn't really need our decisions on that. Um, and it's learned a long time ago that it's a good idea to breathe without our involvement. But there is another system in our body, not the central nervous system, but something that we call the parasympathetic system. And it sort of exists everywhere else, yeah? And we are in a relationship with our bodies. That's what we are. We're in a relationship up here with our bodies. And it's a very powerful factor in how smart we can be. Does that come as a bit of a shock for you? Yeah? That your emotions really do affect how well you can learn in a situation. Now, I, I think that's pretty obvious and I think you will understand it if I give you a little bit of an example here. So whatever's going on in our thoughts, for example, so whenever you get anxious, you can start to feel a little bit unpleasant, like um, emotions like fear, or a bit of panic, even rising panic, and that might not be the best emotion to help you learn a new skill. And I know, I you know, I learned to drive once upon a time and I've had to learn to cook a meal in front of someone. And I know how emotions can stop you learning and stop you performing. Um, you might be someone who is motivated by a little bit of adrenaline. Yeah, that's that that um, fluid in your brain that gets you excited. Or you might actually be someone who um, it gets flooded with too much adrenaline and that actually makes you respond in a negative way to um, a new situation where you're trying to learn a new skill. And one of the best things you can do is just to learn how to manage anxiety in becoming smart. So I suppose that's the first thing I wanted to say to you. So it, it doesn't stop you from becoming smarter. So I want you to take your pen or pencil again, remember those, or, or if you're typing, you can type, and just maybe write down a time when you felt that actually your parasympathetic nervous system actually stopped you from learning or, or might have been doing that for quite a long time for all sorts of different reasons. And it's good to identify, it's really good to reflect on uh, the way that your own body could maybe sabotage you from learning. Now, I've got a, a little solution here just while you are writing down your lovely things that upset you. Uh, one good way to sort of counteract that when you're trying to learn stuff, and, and this is so important for exams, because it's not, not just about learning, but for exams or, or assessments, it's about recall as well, isn't it? 
So you you sort of can get quite anxious in those situations where you either have to learn or recall stuff. Yeah. Witnesses are useless, by the way. It's been proven. They hardly remember anything. As soon as a policeman says, what do you recall from that incident? Your brain just goes blank. So um, it's sometimes helpful to calm the anxiety with a little mantra. That's quite a sort of spiritual word. It means just a little saying that you can repeat and use in different situations. And, and I have a mantra. And the mantra I use, this is my personal mantra, is, is a really simple one. I say to myself, just start and don't stop till it's finished. And that's what I've been saying to myself since I was a young girl. Yeah, because I had to work hard and lots of you have to work hard. But I was working hard in my mum and dad's shop. I was trying to work hard doing the housework. I was trying to work hard doing my studies. Poor Mrs Strafford. But it really taught me to keep calm and just be a grafter. And sometimes becoming smart is just about working hard. And not stopping till you get there. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I don't know. Mr. Boylan, if you're listening, I hope he's listening. I was just going to ask you if you have a mantra. Is that putting you on the spot? <laughs> I don't have a mantra, no. Uh, I, I don't. I just get on with it. <laughs> I maybe should have a mantra. Uh, yeah. I've written I've written down a potential mantra here, but I'll uh, uh, I don't know. I'll come up with a mantra. I'll I'll give you a mantra by the end of the call. I'm, okay. I'm thinking of one. But just just get on with it. It's not a bad mantra. Another one that's really useful, especially if you're someone that does get flooded with a lot of anxiety. I can see some of you are very calm and collected people, but maybe some of you do get anxious. Another good one is to say when you get anxious and you're about to do a big thing and you feel people are looking at you, you're going to get embarrassed or fail, etc. Just tell yourself, what I'm feeling right now is not fear, it is not panic, it's excitement. I am excited about doing that, and that is a really useful thing to do. Um, let's look, move on a little bit. So we've been looking at quite a lot of signs here. And um, what I want us to think about now is, I tell you what, I'll get anxious if my um, thing doesn't move up. It's moving up. See, I don't trust myself to talk to you without at least some notes. Is that uh, we've established that there is a lot of signs to support the idea that you can become smarter. Yeah, a lot of signs, no matter who you are. Except for my dog. My dog doesn't appear to be becoming smarter. If anything, the opposite. Um, and clearly as a school, uh, we want to help you to develop uh, the sort of smart that enables you to perform well in ultimately your, your exams and progress well in your formal education. That's our official service to you. But it's bigger than that, isn't it? You are more than just the sum of your exam results. And there are all sorts of ways of being smart, some of which I put up there for you to have a look at nine different ways that you can be smart and then that you can develop. Um, you know, things like, I'm not going to go through them all, but you could be uh, very smart in terms of music or intrapersonal. That means you're very good with people. Yeah. Or you're very good um, linguistically. So you can uh, listen to all different points of view and put together an argument and you can summarise ideas really well. You might be excellent as a logician, you know, with mathematics and things like that. You might be a blend. And I'm going to say something really interesting to you. I hope you find it interesting. Now, often what happens is that people who become particularly smart in one area, it tends to have a knock on effect in other areas of their life as well. So if they're dedicated as a sports person, they become quite dedicated as a 
um, and student. Uh, they become dedicated as a speaker uh, in all sorts of ways. And sometimes you hear people saying of others, oh, her, oh, him. They are brilliant at everything. And it is true. There are always people like that who appear to be brilliant at everything, but often it's simply because they are. Um, what they're doing is they're flexing those muscles in their brain and they're forming a character that tends to be quite successful. So that's what I want to to look at next. What actually can you do? Can you think about in terms of making your character a little bit more more intelligent? So there's another theory out there. And the other theory says that anyone can become an expert in a skill, even like chess or the high jump if they just put in enough practice and uh, the, the practice number of hours that that person came up with was 10,000. 10,000 hours of practice would be enough to make you skilled at whatever it was you wanted to be skilled at. So you can do the maths, but that means that it would take you maybe 20 years to become an expert if you practiced at something 10 hours a week. And they've done all sorts of studies on this uh, for people who are particularly gifted musicians and all of that sort of thing. I've got a nice picture of Tiger Woods there, who obviously is a very skilled golfer. However, I'm going to challenge that theory before I let it sit there. And what I would love to do, I'm just going to come and see your faces and I'm not happy about not being able to talk to you in this. So I'm going to ask you before I uh, go on to reveal what's wrong with that theory, because we always have to question theories. That's one of the things about being smart. Always ask questions. Can any of you think of something that's wrong with that assumption that if I practice for 10,000 hours, I'm going to become as good at golf as Tiger Woods. Or I'm going to become a chess champion. What could be wrong with that? Right, Harrison, you give me an answer. I can see your hand up. Well, it, what can be go wrong is sometimes if you do too much of something, you can get you can start not liking it. It could uh -huh. be right. like a, Thank you. your emotions could change. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you feelings. there. You've come up with a really interesting thing. It really depends on whether you're motivated, whether you actually like the thing you're doing. Too true. Aditya, anything else wrong with that theory? Mm, thank you. Whilst I think what the quote was at the beginning of the call, I'm sorry, I can't remember who quoted it. Whilst Dweck. Dweck, he said that the cards you're dealt is essentially just a starting point for your development. And that absolutely makes sense. But at the same time, I think when it comes to a certain skill, 10,000 hours sounds very vague especially because we are born with some talent over the others, which can be consistent over the years. And then there's the human's uh, capability to maintain discipline. So motivation. Yeah, as said earlier. motivation. Thank you. You've raised a few things there. Motivation, discipline. And yes, we all pop out into the world and maybe we, we have got differing skills. You know, we're just born with them. Adeline, I'll take one more point from you and then we'll have a wee look at what um, I discovered. So um, the problem I think with this idea is that like if you do something for 10,000 hours, it doesn't necessarily make it engaging because for the, but because like if you do something for 10,000 hours, as you said, you might get worn out. And plus, it's not like after it's, it's it kind of makes you seem like after 10,000 hours, you'll be really good at it. But the thing is, just because you do it 10,000 hours doesn't mean that you'll actually love it. And the most important thing about doing something is that you love to do it. Yeah. And the passion. Very, very good summary there. Uh, you're absolutely right. I put down on my list there that you're just going to become quite fed up. Um, so uh, let's have a wee look at the next slide. Hang on a minute, I said. That might not be right. 
there are factors that could affect you. You could be born, as Aditya said, with an innate talent there that you then develop. And so you're, you're born kind of ahead of the game, so to speak. Your physiology. Yeah, I, I used to go out and play golf with my dad. He had longer arms than me. He was stronger than me. There was, there was no way I could swing the club like he did. Opportunity. Some people do not have the opportunity to um, have, say, and this is true of golf, I'll just stick with golf, the money to play at the best clubs, the money to buy the best clubs, there are two different meanings of the word club, um, et cetera, et cetera, the competition necessary to become better. So opportunity is really important. Luck, does luck have a part to play in how brilliant we get at something and finally our interests which you guys discovered as well so you guys have definitely uh, got the brains to figure out what's wrong with that theory so does that mean then that uh, there are some people who just cannot become smart or excellent at something and you will be relieved to hear that the answer is Everyone can develop their skills and their knowledge, no matter what their starting point is. So I want to come back to Cambridge Homeschool because I like it. And I want you to, to remind you of our school values. There they are. Uh, our values of community, excellence, to be goal orientated. Uh, and we value innovation. We value integrity. That's an interesting one, but we're not going to talk about it just now for another day. And resolve. That's it, the determination to keep going. So your school believes that these things are really, really important and really useful qualities in life. And they're really important for you to develop it. So that everything that you do in the school, in your online school life, in your offline school life, is developing these values. We hope that's it. That's a plan. They can all help you to become smarter, every single one of those. But there's one that I want to focus on in particular, and that is excellence. Yeah, excellence. And if we just pause for a second to think what excellence means, and it really means um, becoming the best possible version of you, um, achieving your academic goals, because after all, that's what the school is, is here. That's its prime reason for being here. We really want to support you in that. But we also really want you to enjoy that journey. It could be very easy, although I haven't met an unhappy child yet at your school. I can honestly say that. Um, but sometimes it can be hard. School life can be hard and you forget to enjoy it. You forget to enjoy the learning journey. So um, this is about you. It's about thinking about how you can become more excellent. So I'm wondering if uh, you'll have a kind of an idea of what an excellent student looks like. So I thought it would be quite amusing to show you what an excellent student doesn't look like. They don't look like that. They genuinely don't. That is somebody who is overtired, is trying to do too much. And like Adeline and a few of the others of you said uh, or thought, is not enjoying, is not committed to what they're doing. That's what we don't want. We don't want people to be exhausted in their pursuit of becoming smart. In fact, oh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but being tired is a real barricade to learning. It's a problem. So <clears throat> excellence is about having a brain that is feeling beautiful, a brain that is feeling uh, very chilled. Uh, it's colourful because it's uh, got lots of diversity and variation in it. It's fresh like a summer garden. What's she on about? Well, I simply mean 
that excellence is what we call a well-being word. It's about being happier in who you are and in what you're doing and what you're learning and just feeling confident. It's a well-being word. So striving towards excellence or aiming for excellence in, in your work, in becoming smarter, should be something that you enjoy and it doesn't feel like a dreadful chore. So the first step to becoming excellent at something then is to grab any opportunity you can. So I'm going to pause another little minute here and I want you just to write down what are some of the opportunities that you have at this school, maybe in lessons or part of the wider school life that you can become excited about. And remember, excitement gets rid of the stress. When you're excited about things, you don't feel stressed about them. And, and grown-ups know that too. We think about that a lot. I, I could get stressed about doing a talk to you or about starting my new job, but instead I decided to feel excited about those things. Yeah, and it's just a tiny change of word that makes all the difference. So. Have you written down a couple of things? I'm hoping you have about any opportunities that you think you could grab in this school. And the funny thing about that, or the interesting thing, is that the more opportunities you take, the more things multiply. So I asked one person in the school if they wouldn't mind um, creating a lovely poster for me and they did such a wonderful job of that. I asked them if they wouldn't mind creating a brochure for me and they did such a lovely job of that. I asked them if they wouldn't mind speaking to you during this talk. So you're going to meet someone, I hope they're here, in this school who's definitely been someone that has seized opportunities and they've led to more opportunities. So that's really, really important. So I'm hoping you've written down something interesting, like a little club or a challenge or a competition or something that you think might be a nice opportunity for you. So there are three ways that you can become smarter or, or more excellent. And um, aside from the opportunities, the three ways that you can build your smartness is you need to know stuff. That's why I've put knowledge there. You need to know stuff. You need to practice stuff. That's why I've put skills there. And you need to develop your personality. And it's really, really important to develop the personality or the character that can become smart. But we'll chat about that a little bit later. Um, Let's have a little look at knowledge. Knowing stuff is pretty straightforward. I'm going to take you back to your childhood now to the best writer ever, Dr. Zeus. And he had a very simple way of approaching this. The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you go. And just think about that for a second. Um, you've got opportunities to read. You can read fiction. That helps you find out about lots and lots of things. Only The only reason I got through my A-level history and understood what was going on during the French Revolution was because I got an obsession with novels about Napoleon when I was 12 and 13. And I just learned a lot from reading that fiction, to be honest. You can learn a lot from non-fiction, factual books too. And we have got you a super duper library that will be opening up to the whole school at half term. We're just trialing it with the younger years at the moment, but um, please use it. You can learn stuff from YouTube tutorials, uh, TikTok. My children learn so much from TikTok, it's shocking. Uh, you can learn stuff from documentaries, watch Frozen Planet, whatever you want, travel documentaries, they're brilliant. You can learn stuff from podcasts, uh, from magazines, uh, blogs, films, 
all of these things, multimedia, in fact, you could probably tell me even more things, but I want to tell you something else. You learn stuff from talking to people. I haven't even got it on my slides and it's probably the most important thing. Talk to your parents, talk to your friends, talk to people who are smarter than you, talk to people who know stuff you would like to know. So when you get further up the school, you start to think about going to maybe a university and you might want to go to a very top university and you'll be fighting against a lot of other people, sometimes 14,000 other people who want 30 places to study uh, economics at Oxford, because I think that's the ratio, not putting you off, by the way. And uh, what I advise people who want to do that to do is to start communicating with some of the lecturers at the colleges they're interested in going to and find stuff out. Say, sir, I see you have read a book, uh, written a book on X, Y and Z. Could you recommend, I enjoyed it, could you recommend something else for me to read? Start talking to people cleverer than you and you will begin to become smarter. Yeah, so this is all about knowing stuff and your parents are a good source of knowledge for you as well as your teachers. So you will learn stuff in school. We'll teach you lots in your lessons, but you can supplement that. Yeah, with in lots of other ways. Uh, another thing about uh, knowing stuff is making sure that you you ask questions have a curious mind and so don't just stop at oh I've just read a book on on Vikings why don't you you read another one why don't you find out about what the Vikings did once they stopped killing people in this country in England because they settled they actually became Christians that's interesting and you can then start following little routes and pathways and that again is how you become more intelligent you might even decide to learn Old Norse because you're interested in Vikings. You, you probably think I'm being silly, but I mean it. You, you really just follow a trail and you become smarter until you eventually become an expert in something. So the next aspect of becoming clever is, is skills, is practice. And we've already chatted about how practicing can improve your skills. You all know that for something as simple as learning to drive but um if you are starting to learn a skill in one of your academic lessons uh the biggest failure according to john wooden is just not acting at all just not starting because it seems like too difficult a thing to do and um i have come across that starting to teach literature in this school I've come across a few students who've never done literature before and uh, there's a student who I know will do well because they've told me I don't get this and I need to learn this and what can I do to to become smarter at it and what I've said to them is the second point there is that what we're doing is we're breaking the skill down into little sub skills so I want you now to, to make another note of something. Is there a subject in the school that you find tricky? Say, for example, you find um, an aspect of maths tricky like algebra, then you might want to break that down into sub skills. Yeah, if you can't do quadratic equations and you find it really, really hard, then go back to the simple equation. Go back to the simple equation and build on that. And if you need to ask someone to help you, like your friend, your parent, your teacher, then ask them. And once you've mastered the little sub skills, eventually when you're at university and doing the research, you will apply your algebra to doing advanced statistics and you will you will be able to analyze all the research that you do, all because you understood algebra at school. So it's, it's really I'm just trying to encourage you. It's really important to try and, and start, don't be intimidated and, and build on your skills. Um, the other thing about skills is it's really important to actually assess 
uh, yourself. Um, how how far have you developed your your skill? And it's so beneficial to to be a reflective learner. Um, there's no point in in just practice, practice, practice without actually reflecting on whether you've you've learned anything or you know to improve something. I mean, one thing that's quite a good idea to do is to decide that you're going to put not, you know, 20 years worth of practice into it, but I'm going to challenge you now to write down a skill that you think you could put a hundred hours of practice into, a hundred hours. Now, a hundred hours, let's take the school year. Let's say we've got 35 weeks in the year. And what you could do is practice a skill for, say, three hours a week. That would be 100 hours. And now just see what happens. So in a year's time, write a little promise to yourself now. I'm going to practice this and see where I am with my maths in a year's time. And you should view the challenge as a really great opportunity. Again, not something to feel like, oh, no, but something to feel excited about as an opportunity to learn and definitely not a source of embarrassment, because that's another way, another emotion that just stops us learning when we get embarrassed. Uh, let's move on. So we've established that the goal of practice is in practice is progress. So don't ever get, you know, mistaken and think if I just keep practicing simple equations, I'll definitely get on to quadratic equations. That That's not how it works. You actually have to progress. And the other thing, and I, I mean this, this is really important. You have to practice when you're at your best. And that's usually early in the day. And I again, I have another mantra. If I don't get up, get ready for the day at whenever it is half past six or maybe even force myself to do a run then it's not going to happen later on because I'm too tired and I want to just sit down in front of the tv with a big box of biscuits once it gets a bit later so I have to get up and do it first yeah now the reason for this is because your brain isn't like a muscle it gets tired so if you already find something hard like literature or maths then if you try and do it when you are tired, it takes you to what I would call a tipping point. It's really not a good idea to try and do something difficult when you're tired because you will feel like a failure and you will just feel like giving up. Yeah. So that's important. The last thing I want to talk about, and I feel like I've talked too long because I do want to talk to somebody in the school, is your, your character traits or aspects of your character. If you can develop them, you will become a much better learner. So here's Michael Jordan. Who doesn't love Michael Jordan? We all love him. He says, this is from him, my greatest skill was being teachable. I was like a sponge, even if I thought my coaches were wrong, I tried to listen and learn something. So being teachable is so important. So if you're someone who gets a fixed view of what uh, um, a text means or uh, something in science, it becomes impossible for you to progress. OK, so I'll give you another idea. If you get a fixed view of what's going on in physics, yeah, when you are 16 doing your GCSEs, you're going to find it quite hard when you go to university and you're doing mechanical engineering or electrical engineering to move on with your intelligence and apply the little bit of stuff you understood at school to a much more complex theory at university because you're not able to shift, yeah, your views, yeah. Things are all just theories. We all have to move on in our views. So <clears throat> I'll give you a little secret here. When, um, again, when I'm coaching students for interviews at really top universities, I always tell them, I'll keep Michael Jordan up there a bit longer because he's so impressive. I always tell them that the feedback I get from Oxford and Cambridge says this, uh, we're not taking that person because that person refused to listen to feedback in the interview. 
And we are going to take that person because when we challenged that person and showed them why they're working out was wrong, say in a maths puzzle, they went, oh, so it is. Well, maybe I need to approach the problem in a different way. And the tutors at Oxford and Cambridge think, brilliant. We are on to someone who has a sort of brain that is willing to learn and not have a fixed opinion. And uh, that's about resilience as well. It's like not being frightened to fail at something, learn from it and move on. Yeah. So very quickly, these are the things that um, I did a bit of research in the past on this that seems to be what characterises somebody who becomes smart and goes on becoming smarter. They're quite humble people. They're curious people. We talked about that. They, they're autonomous, they can do stuff on their own. They're quite flexible. They're willing to change their minds. They're willing to take a risk. Yeah, that's how we learn also. Collaboration, I think, is one of the most important things. So if you get the opportunity in this school to collaborate with other people, get together, make a magazine, get together, build a spaghetti bridge, get together and enter competition or, or do a debate, it changes the physiology in your brain. You see, I'm coming back to your brains being an organic thing that changes, yeah? And it makes your brain stronger. Have you got a good work ethic? That's that's all I've got, by the way. I just feel like if I work hard enough, I'll get there, and I do to a certain extent. I, could, I would be better if I collaborated more, wouldn't I? Maybe you can have a think just now. Look at these. Write down the ones that you think you're good at, or maybe the ones you think you need to develop. Oops, I'll keep it up for a second longer. Can I ask um, Zenya? Zenya, are you here? Can you yes, declare yourself this year? She is there, ma'am. I've seen her. <clears throat> Lovely. Hi, Zenya. Now, I, I was so impressed with you because I asked you to do things and I felt like I could give you more opportunities and you did them again. And I thought, how is this girl functioning better than me at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> how is this young girl? You're in uh, L4, L3, L4, L3. Yeah, how, how come Senya has got such a hold on on her time management, etc. To to do so well, she does really well, folks, in her lessons, and and she does well in other stuff, right? So she's screwing up her nose because she's embarrassed. That's fine, actually. She's humble. So can I ask you what tips would you have for our uh, lovely student body here on on how do you do it? Oh well, I guess there's no secret really. Um, it's I don't like to have it all up in my head so I like to you know plan and look at the steps to be able to get to the bigger picture to the end goal and I like to write those steps down be it on old-fashioned pen and paper or um, using apps because um, with modern technology of course everything works wonderfully so apps with um, calendars and checklists to be able to track your progress as well um, and know you're making progress because that also gives you a sense of accomplishment as well if you know um, how far down the path you are and how much work you still need to do to be able to reach your goal and um, I would lastly say I also like to prioritize to, to be able to know um, on which piece of the puzzle I should focus my attention first and knowing when to be uh, when I am able to move on to the next um, step. I think that's really brilliant advice about how to manage time, have goals, prioritise. Absolutely brilliant. Can I ask you one other thing, Senya? Do you um, always feel calm because you look calm? Do you manage to say, right, I'm, I'm not all, you're getting some applause there, quite right too. Do, do you always feel calm or are there, are there times when you have to say something to yourself to say, I can do this, I'm not stressed? Uh, definitely, I'm not calm all the time. 
Um, it it does help to keep your uh, keep your mindset right um, to be able to stay calm. Um, but there are times where you need to, you know, um, if you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, where you have to just let go of that. And that's where it helps to have the support system of family and friends. Um, but then, as you said as well, mantras and mottos, they are uh, helpful as well. Um, I'd say there are one or two that I use. Uh, the one that comes to mind right now is your attitude determines your altitude. And mm. oh, there's one more that um, comes to mind. It might be it might sound a little bit silly, but it's just keep swimming. I love that one. Just keep swimming. I am going to borrow that as well. And I think that's particularly helpful for you because I know you do sailing competitions. <laughs> so <laughs> if things go wrong, just keep swimming. That's brilliant. I love that. Listen, Zenia, thank you so much. Uh, that's been so helpful. Um, somebody might have a question for you in a minute. Um, I thought I would give the last word to um, Dweck again who says that you should just love challenges, be intrigued by mistakes, enjoy the effort and keep on learning, keep on learning, um, which is, is brilliant, it's so encouraging. And just to remember that there are so many opportunities at the school, um, being here at the lecture series helps you be smarter, being teachable, um, keep reading, coach others, that really helps you to become smart, um, be an active participant, so uh, we've got co-curricular, extracurricular activities, being present isn't enough, actually take part, that helps you to learn and become an expert in something, so the last thing I was going to suggest you do is write down something you might want to become an expert in and maybe you could give one of these talks. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm at the end. I'm, I'm saying welcome to success. It is a journey. I really want you to enjoy it. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Uh, let me see your lovely faces again. Oops, it just disappeared. And um, see if anyone has any questions. Thank you for the clapping. Anybody got any questions you could ask Senya or me oh Mrs Graham oh gosh is Mrs Graham going to fact check me on my um inaccurate signs Mrs Graham hello not at all I'm not going to fact check you I think it was very interesting and I love it and I do feel through life as a young person it could be very stressful and overwhelming and even as an adult in different roles and moving to other jobs being part of senior leadership I found quite a lot of things very stressful and I think what I learned to do a couple of things one I used to say because I have got a faith I'm not a very good person but I try my best and you say God give us a hand here and it worked for me <laughs> but, but sometimes I used to say just breathe put one foot in front of the other sometimes my life I'm a person that when I know something needs to happen I make it happen immediately I don't hang about. I know that change has to happen and I just keep going. And you don't know what's going to happen when you make change. But the more you do it and the more you face things head on and think, I've got to do it. I know the outcome. And you put one foot in front of the other. People support you. You get a, yeah. lot, of, a lot of support and it kind of rolls. And you think, oh, well, I did it last time. I went to Tanzania. That was OK. I survived two and a half years later. I made a difference. I did something I was a bit scared of and actually in doing so I'm a different person and I'm much happier and the ability to give I, I was you know very very inspired by humble people who taught yes. me the view of life so I think my my mantra would be keep going do things that frighten you do something that frightens you every day even if it's a time excellent keep growing yeah take take a leap of faith was on my list as well take yeah. a leap of faith yeah, yeah. Aditya you've You've got your hand up. and and half half as well. Sorry, I can't quite read your home. So we'll hear a teacher. Uh, Mrs. Trafford. Now, ha, the largest audience, just an anecdote, the largest audience I've ever addressed was maybe about 200 people. When I was up there, I was almost panicking. 
I didn't have a mantra, but I just managed to look at my friends and we decided to get it done. How many times during this talk have you told yourself your mantra in your head? Just get it done. Do you know what? Not once. Because I'm once I start, the f any worries gone. I'm just doing what I need to do. Mm. And I'm really happy doing it. And I would I would encourage people to do that. Let go of the side of the swimming pool and swim. And it's OK. Honestly, not once. Um, and I did do a TED talk. I was telling Dr. Page about it and it was frightening because I thought I, I'm going to make a mistake here and it's being filmed. But at once I got up and started, no worries, no worries. So there, that's a lovely idea. We've got one time for one last question. We're actually a minute over, but ha is it Hafsa? Sorry, I can't read your name properly. Yeah, it's Hafsa. I just wanted to ask real quick, um, how important is patience when it comes to intelligence or like getting smart? Yeah, that was also in the research and um, to be patient with yourself. And I think you probably know the Thomas Edison story in the light bulb. He was very successful. He invented the light bulb, but only after 1000 failed attempts. So yeah. I think that's a good good one to end on, isn't it? Um, I'm so sorry, I probably spoke longer, which meant there's no time for questions, but you can always stick questions to us later. Uh, thank you so much as ever. You've been a very super thank nice you. audience and we'll see you in two weeks time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye bye night night mrs mrs trafford can you hear me i can i am going to now stop the mm -hmm. recording perfect that's what i was about to say